Hey guys what's up, I hope you all good, so here is special movie, because we are very close to 10k sub family, so please do subscribe, so in this video, we are gonna see, what if Deaneries had absurd Indras and Ashura's Chakra, this movie part 1, and if you want part 2 of this movie. Then please do like share and subscribe, so let's get in the video. Victory was not what Robert Baratheon thought it would be like at all. The Targaryen scum was off the Iron Throne, and King's Landing was now his. House Baratheon was now the royal family, and all of Westeros bent the knee to him in fealty. The last of the Targaryens were running away to Dragonstone and would soon be dealt with when Stannis his younger brother took it for his own. His greatest friend and best general, Eddard Stark, was going to take his father's place as Lord Paramount of the North and Lord of Winterfell, his birthplace. Jon Arryn accepted the position of Hand of the King and would help guide Robert through his rule, like he always did, even when he and Ned were still just children. He had it all. The Seven Kingdoms bowed to him as the one true king, and the Iron Throne was his alone to sit upon. Yet, he felt like he still lost. The love of his life and Ned's sister, Lyanna, didn't make it. Slain by the Mad King before Jaime Lannister, a member of the Kingsguard, put his sword through the Targaryen's back. She was his everything, Lyanna. She was the reason he fought so hard, so brutally. He cut down Rhaegar Targaryen in battle single-handedly. He took her from him, so he took his life. He united the Baratheons, Starks, Aarons, Tullys, and the Bloody Lannisters under his command, for her. He defeated the last dragon, for her. Yet even still, the gods took her away from him. He lost everything. Or so he thought. Alone in the throne room, the now King Robert Baratheon sat on the most powerful chair in the world, as tears freely fell down his face. He was in the dark, and he would not let the gods judge him for mourning the woman he loved more than anything else, not when they were the ones who took her away from him. All his power, all his possessions, all his victories, all of it meant nothing now. He couldn't share it with her, so what was the point? He won the war, but he lost the only thing that was actually important. Robert. A voice rang behind the doors that led into the throne room. The king chuckled softly, no humor in his tone. Isn't it your grace, now? He whispered cynically. Robert Baratheon, you open these damn doors now. The voice of John Aaron was even louder than before. Speaking to him like John usually did when they were kids snapped Robert out of his pity, causing the warrior inside him to bleed out. Standing with a snarl, Robert rushed the doors he locked himself behind, his face twisted in rage, a mask for his sorrow and loss. Speak to me like that again, and I'll cut your tongue from your mouth and shove it down your throat, old man. He yelled as he reached for the door, opening them easily with his raw strength. He opened his mouth to continue to scold and threaten his mentor, but the moment he saw what was in his arms, the new king froze. You were saying, boy. John asked with a knowing smirk on his face. Whose child is that John? Robert asked. His heart seemed to stop and speed up all at the same time, and his mouth became dry. The smile that lit the new hand of the king's face made Robert swallow hard. He looked just like her he had her eyes. This is your son Robert. Yours and Lyanna's son. The word sent chills down his spine, and his hands shook. That's impossible. She the words disappeared in his throat. He couldn't say it. He couldn't say that she was no longer among the living. We found her journal Robert. She wrote about him, about you. She became pregnant the last time the two of you were together and gave birth to him not three months ago. John placed a hand on Robert, a smile still on his face. You have a son, my boy. The feeling of being all alone was slowly vanishing, being replaced by a new emotion. Lyanna was gone he would never feel her gentle touch again. He would never taste her lips against his again. With those thoughts, Robert felt as if he would rather die and be with her than be without. The colors faded and everything was bathed in the darkness of his sorrow. But now as the broken man looked on into the pure black eyes of his son of Lyanna's son, the colors seemed to come back. Just staring into the eyes of a newborn gave him more hope and courage than having his entire army at his back or Eddard Stark at his side. Robert slowly reached out, silently telling John to give him the boy, and he did. And the moment he had his son in his arms, the broken man was broken no longer. The broken man was now King Robert Baratheon, a man who ended the Targaryen rule that had lasted for centuries in a single year. The babe had been crying the entire time he was in John's arms, but the moment Robert touched him, he was silent. Big, onyx eyes looked up at the king, an already curious face about him. Robert laughed loudly. My son will grow up to be a fine man. He shouted to the seven heavens, as if mocking the gods. Lyanna lives on in this boy. His eyes drifted from the sky to his first son. And I dare you to try and take him from me he whispered with so much fierce and determination, John Aaron was taken aback. John wasn't sure how Robert would take knowing that a child was born from him and Lyanna, now that she was dead. Whatever he had in mind, this was not it. Robert looked at the boy with the eyes of a father, a true father, and for Robert, that was a scary thing. 
The Baratheons started an all-out civil war against a dynasty that had been in place for hundreds of years and won. And for the man's son. He would probably burn the world to ash if anything threatened him. Well, the boy needs a name. John began, deciding to protect the child so nothing catastrophic would happen. He raised Robert and uttered, what was one more? He already has a name John. Robert spoke, his eyes never leaving the boys. Marcus. That's what Lyanna wanted a son born from us to be named Marcus Baratheon. John's eyes widened. You're giving him your family name? Robert chuckled, which was the opposite of what John thought he'd do. This boy is no bastard we might not have been married in the eyes of the gods, but in our hearts, and the hearts of those who knew how we felt about each other, we were every bit as married as anyone and fuck the gods. He whispered the last bit, but it was loud enough for John to hear. After a moment of contemplating his new king's decision, John sighed. He was tired and getting old. Young Marcus Baratheon it is, then. Now let's just pray he's nothing like you. Robert and John locked eyes for a moment, and then the two suddenly burst into laughter, their voices filling the throne room like thunder. And then it happened. Marcus giggled alongside them, his little face expressing nothing but childish happiness. His giggles stopped the men's laughter. The king and the hand of the king just stared at the black-haired youngling with an expression of wonder. But that did not deter the babe. He just kept giggling, holding on to his daddy's finger. And that was the first day John saw it in years. The tears of Robert Baratheon fell freely once more. Neither Robert nor John seemed to notice the two distinct markings on the boy palms. Not the sun-shaped mark on his right or the crescent moon-shaped mark on his left. Being king was not at all what Robert Baratheon thought it would be like. Half a million people looked to him for guidance, and that was in King's Landing alone. There was no easy quiet day. There was always someone, somewhere, who needed him to hold their hand. It was starting to get on Robert's nerves. All the people in the kingdom couldn't amount to the kind of irritation Cersei Lannister could muster up within him, though. The woman was beautiful, there was no doubt, but she was not Lyanna, and she never would be. Lyanna Stark was his one true love, and Robert only married her to reward the Lannisters for sacking King's Landing for him during his rebellion, and only then because John Aaron, his hand of the king, convinced him to. She was too smart for her own good, and he was smarter than she thought him to be. He could see the way she looked at his son, at Lyanna's son. Marcus was his reminder. With him, Robert would never forget the love of his life, he would never forget Lyanna, and that did not sit well with Cersei. Robert wasn't worried, though. The queen, along with everyone else, knew that if anyone tried to harm his firstborn son, he'd make them wish for the release only death could give them. It had been a constant argument between the two of them for a while. Cersei and the rest of the Lannisters were outraged that he would give his bastard son his surname. Thankfully, that would stop very soon. The annoying woman was pregnant and would give birth any day now. It angered him, incredibly so, but after speaking with John, Robert decided to name his second son his heir when he was born, not Marcus. He hated politics, but he knew of its importance. And by the looks of it, Marcus wouldn't need to be king. He was already walking hell, already running. The boy was fast for his age and coordinated beyond belief. He was definitely not like other children, not at all. He would stare at people, watch them, and observe them. His son was smart. Your grace. Robert's musings were interrupted by the sound of John's voice. All he wanted to do was sit in his study and eat his lunch with his son, but he was king, and a king's duty was never over. Yes, yes, come in. Robert shouted at the door, his tone showing his annoyance. The hand of the king entered with a nervous expression. Robert, John began, always using his first name when in private, you must come with me. His tone was just as on edge, which let Robert know something was up. What's wrong with you John? I haven't seen you this uptight since well, I've never actually seen you this uptight before, come to think of it. Robert chuckled, his face already red from the wine. Just come with me, boy. This is serious. John snapped. Robert was taken aback for a moment, not having been talked to like that for a long while. John sighed. I apologize but you really need to come with me. And bring Marcus with you. Robert sighed, nodding. He'd humor his old mentor. Fine, fine, he groaned. Standing up, the king gestured for his son to follow. Come, Marcus. Uncle John is in need of our presence. Marcus mild, nodding. The little boy jumped up from his chair and ran at his father, holding onto his pant leg. Robert Baratheon sat on the Iron Throne, wondering what he was doing there. For what reason was I needed here John, the king asked. John just waved to the guards at the doors, ordering them to let someone pass. And from the doors, twenty people in white gowns emerged, and everyone knew who they were, especially the man who led them. Your grace, I thank you for seeing us on such short notice. The High Septon bent his knee, bowing to his king. If it weren't urgent, I would not demand your presence so quickly. Rising, the High Septon gave a look in the direction of the Queen, Cersei Lannister, who had a large belly. 
What urgent matter do you speak of? Robert asked. It's your son, your grace there's been a prophecy. King's Landing's religious leader spoke, Sir Say caressing her enlarged stomach. Robert sighed. He still had no faith in the gods, not after Lyanna was taken away from him. He hated them and defied them at every chance. They would not have any more family of his. Please, pray tell, High Septon. What is this prophecy you have seen? John Aaron asked. Robert looked at him in annoyance, but John waved it off. He was quite possibly the only man alive who could do such a thing and keep his head. The High Septon nodded, clearing his throat and licking his lips. And then, he began. The last son has come to be. The last link in the everlasting chain is here. Born of light and dark, he will command all creation and give upon men and women their salvation. For his sons have finally become one, mind and body has merged, and his is the fury. The last son will have strength that will make the gods tremble, and the heavens will be his, if he wishes it. A god among men, he will become. A man, he will choose to be. He will give his heart to the breaker of chains, and she him, and together, they will purify the world in dragon's fire and the heavenly flame. Nothing can stop them. The world is theirs, and we are but humble enough to live in it. The king of kings, the queen of queens, these two will conquer the entire world, and not even the seven will dare get in their way. He will unearth the nine beasts whose tails cause mass destruction. They will give him their strength, as they have done before. That is when destruction incarnate and fire made flesh will slay God, saving us all from eternal slumber. He has returned, the child of prophecy has come back to save us all. He is the savior of this world. Robert just stared on at the man, his eyes narrowed the entire time. This is a prophecy you have seen. As the High Septon, I find it strange that you would say such things against the Seven. John explained. I was shocked myself, Lord Hand. I have served the Seven for many years, my whole life, actually. But this prophecy, this vision it's real. It's going to happen. I know it just as sure as my heart beats. So you're saying Robert began, his voice low and his tone deep. That a son of mine is going to conquer the world and spit on the gods as he's doing it? He asked. The entire throne room was silent, deathly silent. The high septon gulped, sweat falling down his forehead. But then, he straightened his shoulders and held his head up high. That is what we have seen, your grace. He spoke, not caring if they would be the last words he'd ever utter. Again, the throne room was silent and all those who were present the same. Sir Jamie Lannister, a member of the Kingsguard was silent as he watched his excited sister from the corner of his eye. Sir Say Lannister was silent as she marveled at the prophecy of her soon-to-be-born son. Sir Barristan Selmy, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard was silent as he tried to decipher the prophecy. John Aaron, the Hand of the King was silent as he also tried to decipher the hidden message behind the prophecy. Marcus Baratheon, the King's first son was silent as he stared at the High Septon with curious eyes. The nineteen men who followed the High Septon were silent as they watched their king. The High Septon himself was silent as he stared defiantly at his king. And then there was Robert Baratheon, the King of Westeros, who was silently watching the High Septon with serious eyes. All was silent, not even the sound of breathing could be heard in the throne room. And then, the king barked out in laughter. I couldn't ask for anything sweeter. Robert laughed, standing. Tell me, which son will it be? Who will be the king of kings? He asked. The future king, of course. Cersei spoke out, rubbing her belly. Our son will be a god among men, just as the prophecy says. The look on her face said she was better than everyone else, and happy, so very happy. The high septon bowed his head to the queen, a sorry look on his face. I apologize, my lady, but know the child in your womb is not the last son, that's when the aged man gazed upon Marcus, his weary eyes meeting lively onyx. The last son is already born and stands with us in this very room. The high septon, along with his nineteen followers, got on their knees, bowing their heads to the floor. Marcus Baratheon, I, and all of the great September of Baylor are at your service. All eyes widened, seeking the youngest person in the room, who was standing next to his father with the same calm, curious look he had since the beginning. The High Septon was a powerful figure and always has been since the founding of King's Landing. He was the mouthpiece of the Seven and was expected to bow to no man, not even the King. You must be mistake, High Septon Marcus is a bastard and not the heir of my husband. The child in my womb will become King. It has already been decided. Cersei began in a strict tone, obviously being held back. Robert was silent, still staring at his son who was just as calm as always. The Iron Throne rules all of Westeros. It means nothing to the last son. The High Septon began. Your son may become king, but he will not be the king of kings. What proof do you have supporting your claims? John Aaron asked, efficiently interrupting Cersei's inevitable retort. The mark of light and dark, Lord Hand, the High Septon began. It will be on the last son. Robert and John both looked at the man with wide eyes, both men coming to the same conclusion. 
What is the mark? Can you describe it? Robert asked. Cersei looked at her husband, her eyes narrowed. The High Septon nodded. The mark will come in the form of the sun and a crescent moon, your grace. John gulped, slowly turning to Marcus. Your palms, boy, show them to us. Marcus looked at his father with an asking expression, and the king nodded slowly. Do what he asks, son. Robert ordered, his mouth suddenly dry. Marcus turned to the High Septon, and slowly but surely, turned his palms to the crowd. And sure enough, the sun sat in his right hand, and the moon in his left. The High Septon let a single tear fall from his eye, his arms stretched out as if to embrace the air. Grace your eyes upon this boy, my followers, for he will one day save us all. The Flooks could kill, Marcus Baratheon would have been killed by Cersei Lannister. The woman hated the child before, but now now she loathed his very existence. After a moment of mindless staring, John finally snapped out of his stupor, managing to form thought. Why was it you who saw this prophecy? He asked. There was no way the man knew about the boy's birthmarks. Marcus hadn't even left the castle yet, and no one met him without the king present. For him to know about the markings, the prophecy had to be true, or there was a spy. The High Septon shook his head, his face grim. It wasn't just I, Lord Hand John narrowed his eyes in confusion. Are you saying all twenty of you had the same prophetic vision? John asked skeptically. Yet again, the High Septon shook his head. Please, follow me outside these walls, and I will show you. He stood, gesturing to the doors as he and his followers hurried out them. Before John could speak, Robert was up, following the man with Marcus at his side. Sighing, the hand of the king followed, with a reluctant Jamie and a furious Cersei behind him. As they walked, Jamie glanced at Cersei, his twin glancing back with a worried expression. They held their gaze until they reached their destination, just outside the throne room. Jamie looked away, and his eyes widened, causing Cersei to follow his gaze. And when she did, her eyes mirrored his. Robert and John looked on in awe, their minds still trying to comprehend what they were seeing. There were thousands of them. Thousands of people were before them, all of them staring at one person. At Marcus. That's when the High Septon spoke, his voice loud and his tone serious. These are men and women from across the world, even from beyond the wall. We have congregated here because of what we've seen. He started. We have all seen the prophecy what your son becomes. His eyes met Marcus's. You are going to be an extraordinary man when you grow up, little one. Marcus suddenly took a couple of steps forward, looking on at the people. At his people. And then he turned back to them, his eyes closed as he smiled at his father. Behind him, the thousands of people bowed to him, just as the High Septon had before. Only in his second year, and already had thousands bending their knee. Extraordinary indeed. He walked beside his people, the people he found on his own. The people he grew strong with. The people he loved. That's truly what strength was. Love. By forging bonds and cooperating, he was finally able to fight the one man he wished he'd never have to. All of his hard work, all of his strength, it all felt so shallow when he couldn't even save his own brother from himself. He loved all of his people, all of his friends, but he couldn't save the love between him and his own flesh and blood. He would fight his brother tomorrow. And they would both die tomorrow. Together. He was panting. His body ached and burned, like he was on fire. He looked behind him, and his people wept, cursing him for ordering them not to interfere. He looked forward, and his brother was in the same shape as he. Hidden away in the jewel of the giant blue, ethereal warrior, he could see him. He was breathing hard, his eyes narrowed in rage and disbelief. He looked at his hands, the hands of an adult, and he sighed. He was surrounded in golden flame, his mighty six arms poised and ready to strike or defend at his command. He wished they could just stop, but he knew that was impossible. His brother was bitter, enraged that father named him his successor. He was his youngest son. The sword of the titanic entity rose, and he knew his brother was ready. His six arms came together, a giant sphere of black and gold energy coming into existence. The sphere grew and grew, until it was the size of a mountain. This was it. Tears fell down his face. We leave this world together, and Nikki. He took a deep breath. I'll see you in the next life. He rushed forward, jumping into the air to drive his attack into the jewel of his big brother. It was time to die. He was a Sura. Marcus Baratheon awoke in his bed, sweat pouring off his skin and tears running down his face. He was silent for a moment, his eyes wide and his heart pounding. And then, he wept. He screamed for his loss. He wept at the pain his heart felt for what he had to do. He cried loudly, and then he cried even louder. He killed him. He killed his brother, his family. Indra Indra was gone. The figure rushed into the room, her eyes wide in horror. He was screaming and crying uncontrollably. What is wrong, my prince? She asked over his shouting. When she got no answer, she jumped into his bed, her arms wrapping around him in a tight embrace. Marcus, what happened? She asked in a shaky voice. 
Never before in her life as a maid had she ever seen a boy of only seven cry so hard. There was definitely something wrong. Marcus's little body shook, his lungs screaming for air. He couldn't breathe. He he. Who was he? What in the name of the gods is going on in here, Arya? Another maid who heard the screaming asked. She thought they were under siege for a moment there. At the king. Now. Arya shouted, her tone urgent. The younger maid nodded, running out of the doorway. SHH, child, it is all right. SHH she tried to calm him with her voice. Her hand rubbed his back lightly and she rocked back and forth. Suddenly, the boy stopped crying. Arya looked down at him and was met by big puffy eyes. And then, he asked her the question for the very first time. W who am I? It wouldn't be the last time he would ask that question. He had changed. He knew it and it was more than just physical. He thought differently, clearer. Everything was so much clearer. Colors were so wonderful now, so enhanced, so emphasized. Light was a different thing to him now. It no longer lit the darkness, but was actually visible to him, like he could reach out and hold it. The dark wasn't the same, either. No longer would he stumble in the darkness, for there wasn't a place where he couldn't see perfectly anymore. His perception changed, his eyes changed. It had started with the burning. Oh, did they burn at first? It was the dreams, he knew it. He wasn't just making them up, how could he? And with them, the eyes that he watched them with changed. After the burning came the clarity. Clarity in both his surroundings and himself. He was weak, a meat child that couldn't defend himself against anything. These were the thoughts he had now, now that his eyes were different. They were such strange thoughts. Why? Why did he have to get stronger? He was only a child, but he knew that he was different and he needed to do something about his weakness. He inhaled, feeling it inside him. He didn't know what it was or why it was there, but he knew that it was there. Something stirred within him, humming, whispering to him to unleash it, to embrace it. And he could see it, but not just within him, but everyone within everything. It it was blue-blue and sometimes green. He wasn't sure why, but it was much larger within him than others, and even more so in the trees. He could spend hours just looking at a simple tree now, marveling at the blue-green colors that seemed to weep for him. It was a strange thought, but that's what he felt. The trees wanted him to command them, to speak to them. He sighed if anyone found out what he believed, they'd probably think him crazy and lock him up in a dungeon somewhere. And then his father would have them all killed for touching him. He loved his father very dearly, but he didn't like the way he did things. Life was such a precious thing, he knew that now. It was more valuable than gold and jewels and more precious than anything. He hated death, despised it, even. He had killed so many times in his dreams, in his memories it was too much. It was a vicious cycle, a cycle of hatred, pain and suffering. That cycle needed to be broken, and he, somehow, knew that he had to be the one to break it. With every passing day, it grew, getting stronger and stronger. And with each passing day, it became clearer and clearer. He had to do something. That's why his eyes had changed. He was given the power to make a difference, to change it. To change everything. So here he was, in White Sword Tower, studying quite possibly the only two men who could help him with his goals. He wasn't an idiot quite the contrary he knew that the revealing of his eyes could be used against him, but it was worth the risk. He needed help, he wasn't going to deny it. He was a weak boy at the moment, a rather smart incredibly perceptive boy, but a boy nonetheless. So he watched. He watched them swing their mighty swords with great curiosity. His eyes followed the way they moved their feet, like dancers. He watched as they slashed their blades in beautiful arcs. He watched their every move, from their head to their feet, everything. He hadn't been so interested in anything so much in his entire life. Considering that he was seven, that wasn't such a big surprise. Jaime Lannister, the Kingslayer, and Barristan Selmy, Lord Commander of the King's Kingsguard, trained as Marcus Baratheon watched with great excitement. His eyes never left them, the two most skilled knights in all the realm. Jaime Lannister was a member of the Kingsguard when he was only a teenager, the youngest man to ever join the honorable group. The Kingsguard was comprised of the seven best knights in all seven kingdoms, supposedly, and they were tasked with defending the king at all times. Barristan Selmy was an older man, but he was said to be the greatest knight to have been born since Eamon Targaryen. But whereas Eamon gained his fame through his sacrifice for the king, Barristan earned his fame through battle and blood. He had the loyalty of Eamon Targaryen, the skill of Jaime Lannister, and more experience than both of them combined. He was truly an amazing warrior, and that showed as he was watched by a certain raven-haired child. Before he knew it, the Kingslayer's sword was on the ground and his hands were held up, a sign of defeat. Barristan smiled, chuckling. That was a good spar Jamie. Jamie sighed, also smiling. I'll get you next time, old man. Both men laughed, taking it all in good fun. Not many people knew it, but Jamie and Barristan got along quite well. There was a certain respect between the two of them, Marcus could see it. 
Ah, we seem to have a spectator. Barristan said, turning to Marcus. Jamie did the same, eyeing the boy. Hello, my price. The aged knight bowed. Hello Sir Barristan. I apologize if I've bothered your duel Marcus replied. The boy was so mature and polite for his age, and his lessons with the hand showed. He was well educated already, far above the level of the other children his age. Jamie laughed. I do hope you keep those manners when you're older. He would never say it out loud, but the way Prince Joffrey was already acting, he knew he'd be trouble. The blonde-haired boy was only five years old, and he was already throwing temper tantrums, as if he were already king. He did love the boy, though. After all, he was. I would like to train as well, Sir Barristan. Marcus interrupted Jamie's thoughts, stating a rather peculiar thing. Jamie laughed, but Sir Barristan just gave the child a certain look. You wish to train? The Lord Commander of the King's Guard asked. Why? Jamie looked at the older knight, an incredulous expression on his handsome face. You can't seriously be asking that question to a seven-year-old. He pointed to the young prince. He's a little boy, Barristan, the king's favorite son, as well. He'll have both our heads if he's injured playing with swords. And that's only if he can hold one. I can hold one. Marcus said with confidence. And I won't get hurt, either. I know how to use a sword. He stated. Jamie just laughed at the child condescendingly. Forgive me, young prince, but that's impossible. You're only seven years old and have no previous training. Jamie was no stranger to young prodigy, but even he was only still a child at seven a rather brave courageous child, but a child the same. I have dreams. Marcus stated, his gaze turning to the lonely sword that sat on the rack. I'm swinging swords of all kinds in them, fighting hundreds of enemies all at once. Jamie sighed, pinching the bridge of his nose. Marcus ignored him, continuing. I'm faster than the wind and stronger than a hundred men. Sir Barristan looked at the boy with curiosity. I've killed millions of people in my dreams, and with every new dream, it's another foe. Dreams and reality are not the same, boy. Jamie began. He would not give the king any more reason to hate Lannisters. Dreams, yes, but memories Marcus whispered. He was now at the sword rack, his still little fingers tracing the edges of the sword, his eyes falling down the blade as they went. You still haven't answered my question, my prince. Why do you want to train? Barristan asked again. Jamie rolled his eyes and turned around, picking up his own sword and sheathing it. As he turned back, he saw Marcus Baratheon holding the sword he was previously touching. And unlike Jamie had thought, he could hold it like it was weightless. He was wrong, then. He wasn't weak it could be used to enhance his strength, but still, he needed to be taught. Having a book was fine and dandy, but if you couldn't read it, it was worthless. Marcus swung the sword in the same fashion as Sir Barristan did when he disarmed Jamie in their spar, surprising both knights with the amount of detail that was in the swing. It was a perfect copy, in perfect form. It was another gift of his eyes, perfect memory. He could copy anything he saw with perfection, even if he only saw it once. It's what I meant to do the boy replied. And you two were meant to help me. His eyes left the sword and met the eyes of the Kingslayer, and that's when the world first saw them. It had been thousands upon thousands of years, but those eyes never die. Those eyes that are both a blessing and a curse upon the world, and they were now in the possession of quite possibly the most powerful person alive. When Marcus's and Jamie's eyes met, Jamie was greeted by crimson orbs, with single commas in each. The accursed eyes had returned. Sir Barristan kneeled, his eyes falling to the floor. My prince he began, surprising Jamie with his show of obedience. Ever since I saw the High Septon and all those people bow to you, I've known that you were different special. He rose. I would be honored to teach the King of Kings the ways of the sword. Not many people knew it no one at all, actually, but Barristan was a firm believer in the prophecy. He wasn't sure why, but he knew it was his duty to show the last son the ways of the warrior. And now, after seeing eyes that no ordinary man could possibly possess, he was never sure of anything in his life. Both Marcus and Barristan looked at Jamie, who looked as if he wasn't sure of something. He, too, was there when thousands of followers of the Faith of the Seven bent their knee to him. He was there when the High Septon himself touched the ground with his forehead in the presence of the Last Son, the King of Kings for Marcus Baratheon. He had felt it that strange feeling the boy produced just by breathing. He was eerily perceptive and oddly calm, even when being scolded, which wasn't often, the boy rarely did anything wrong. He was no angel, though. He was a child and enjoyed playing childish games, but there was definitely something different about him. Jamie Lannister just stared into those crimson eyes, his mind telling him one thing and his heart another. He didn't know what those eyes were or what made them so special, but he was a skilled warrior, a knight, and his instincts were telling him that those were the eyes of a predator and not to be trifled with. It was a strange feeling, for sure. The child's eyes struck fear in him and he didn't know why. 
It was like he was made to feel fear in their presence, like it was all around him, pushing down on his very being. Why? Jamie asked. Why show me those eyes? Why ask me for help? His sister hated Marcus, and the boy knew it, somehow. Why come to him with something like this, knowing that he could very well use it against him? Why not? Marcus asked. You are my uncle such an innocent, naive answer. Why? Jamie began. I'm the Kingslayer, for one. A dishonorable oathbreaker. The tone in his voice was low, ashamed. And I'm not your uncle. Not really. Marcus tightened his grip on the sword, closing his eyes and taking in a deep breath. When he exhaled, he opened his eyes and smiled at the blonde Kingsguard. I've heard what the High Septon says I am to do the boy looked scared. I'm supposed to slay God in that moment, Jamie realized it. I can't do any of that without help. Jamie realized that the boy was scared. I need to learn, learn how to use a sword, a bow I need to learn how to survive. If I'm to do what everyone thinks I am, then I can't sit around doing nothing, and you two are the best warriors in all the realm. So please, I'm not asking you as your prince or the king of kings I'm asking you as Marcus Baratheon to please help me. He had dreamt or was it remembered. A lot about both Asura and Indra, and he learned one important thing by doing so. No one could accomplish their goals alone. Damie kept the boy's gaze for a long minute, searching for anything else within those strange orbs. And when he found nothing, Jamie Lannister did something his sister would kill him for if she ever found out. He kneeled to his future king. He stood on the mighty beast with nine tails, his powerful eyes encasing the creature in majestic attire. His best friend and worst enemy stood on the giant wooden man, the wooden dragon wrapped around its body. He took in a deep breath. This had to happen. His power surged, the mighty beast stirring with it. And then he leapt, the demon's jaws opening, producing a black sphere of energy. The sphere grew until it was bigger than the creature itself. We don't have to do this, Madara. The man shouted at him. We built the village together. It's our home, our dream. His friend's words were true. It had been his dream. But it was never his home. His own people turned their backs on him. He was all alone, now. His family was gone, their blood soaking the earth. His brothers were laid in a grave now, and it was all the world's fault. The world was a cruel place. There could never be peace so long as they had their freedom. With that in mind, what he had to do was so clear now. He needed to take their freedom from them. Only then could humanity live in peace, for it was humanity that caused chaos and suffering. No he started. We do have to do this, Hashirama. With his goal in mind, he let the nine-tailed demon loose the sphere of pure destruction. His eyes shot open, and he sat up straight. His bed was once again soaked in sweat, and his breathing was labored. He took a moment to calm himself, taking in a deep breath. After letting go of that breath, he closed his eyes, thinking. I am Marcus Baratheon. I am the son of the king. I am in King's Landing. I am Marcus Baratheon. I am the son of the king. I am in King's Landing. Over and over again, he repeated those words. His dreams felt so real that even when he woke, he still thought he was the person in the dream. Right now, he knew he was Marcus Baratheon, but his mind kept telling him that he was also Madara. He shook his head. No. He was not Madara. He was Marcus Baratheon, and he was the son of the king, Robert Baratheon. The door opened, and a familiar face greeted him. Another nightmare, my prince. Arya asked. She had a cup filled with milk and honey with her, already used to this. He'd have nightmares every night, and every night, she would be there for him, comforting him. He didn't have a mother, Lyanna Stark was dead, and the queen didn't care much for the poor child. Cersei would never comfort him. So it was up to the boy's nanny, Arya, who was given the position shortly after the child's first episode by the king himself. The Amarcus nodded. He took the glass of milk and drank it. The cold liquid felt heavenly on his dry tongue and sore throat. They're still so vivid does everyone have dreams like this? He asked. He was still panting, and his eyes burned. He knew no one had dreams like him, but it helped him calm down when he created conversation. Arya's voice helped him remember who he really was. I'm afraid not, my prince. Arya replied honestly. I've never seen anyone have such night terrors before. She never lied to him, that's why he respected her so much. Arya was his motherly figure and one of his favorite people. What was it this time? She asked curiously. Marcus was silent for a moment, his eyes closing as he remembered the entire dream with great detail. I was a man named Madara this time. He began. Arya paid close attention, always fascinated by the boy's dreams. I was angry. I was betrayed by my people, and all of my family was dead he put his hand on his forehead, sighing. I think I was a bad person, Arya. His nanny shook her head. You could never be a bad person, child. She spoke softly, rubbing his back lightly with her hand. Marcus shook his head, though, his face grim. No I was he whispered. 
I was a bad person I was feared by everyone and I could kill hundreds with my eyes alone. It was then that he froze, his eyes widening, fear evident in them. What, child? What is it? Arya asked. She could clearly see his fear, like it was palpable. The eyes in my dream he started, slowly turning to the woman, they were these eyes he whispered. That was the first time Arya saw the accursed eyes. The eyes that were crimson and had two spinning commas each. Lee Bottom, the largest slum district in King's Landing, was a sad, sad place in the eyes of Marcus Baratheon. Women walked the streets with their flesh showing for everyone to see. Children lay in the street, their dirty, hungry bodies enough to bring tears to the young prince's eyes. Men fraud other men, and people stole from one another. Lee Bottom was almost a completely different country compared to the rest of King's Landing, especially the Red Keep. Why do these people have to live like this? Marcus asked his two companions. To his left was his faithful nanny, Arya, who was more like a mother than a nanny. To his right was John Aaron, the hand of the king. Poverty is present in every kingdom, child. The rich and powerful just choose to ignore it. John replied. The boy was only eight, but he understood more than most. Why doesn't my father help them? Isn't there something we can do? Marcus asked. The smell alone was horrid, and the way the people hurt each other sickened him. Can't we at least give these women clothes? John sighed, shaking his head. Those women are called whores Marcus. They make money by taking their clothes off. Marcus narrowed his eyes. I don't like that word they aren't whores, they're people. He crossed his arms over his chest. There has to be something we can do for them. That is why I brought you down here Marcus. I have been teaching you since you were able to talk and this is a lesson I wish I did not have to teach. John put his hand on the raven-haired boy's shoulder, a sorrowful look on his face. I've brought you here so that you can learn that sometimes there isn't anything you can do. Sometimes, injustices happen in this world and we simply cannot fix them. The boy needed to learn this lesson soon. There were just some things you couldn't do. No, Marcus whispered. I don't accept that. His words were too low for anyone to hear, but that didn't matter. Marcus Baratheon would never forget what he saw in Flea Bottom that day. He'd never forget what he had to fix. His long brown hair blew in the wind as he stood on top of his mountain. He and his best friend found this place and their dream was finally about to come too. The sun was warm against his skin and his power hummed within him. The day was the day he created their home. He closed his eyes and interlaced his fingers together. Before his very eyes, life was created. Trees came forth, reaching to the clouds. There were at least 10,000 trees and some of them even bore fruit. And then, wood began to take form, creating buildings as sturdy as stone and much better looking. He was making his home, his kingdom, with his bare hands. He was creating his dream. He had a goal, and he was making it a reality. He could feel his energy surging. Kami, he was powerful. But in minutes, an entire village was created by a single man, by him. The village hidden in the leaves, just as Madara had named it. It was their home. His home. His precious jewel. He'd protect this place with all the power he possessed. Nothing was going to destroy Kanoha. Nothing. He awoke, but it wasn't with a start this time. His eyes slowly opened, and he hadn't been sweating or crying. He lay there, thinking about what he had just dreamt of. The pure power he just felt under his fingertips alone was so much more than any man in the real world could ever hope to attain. He had felt invincible, unafraid. He was always afraid when he dreamt, but he was oddly at peace with this dream this memory. He took in a deep breath and thought of Flea Bottom. If he could command that power again he could save them. He could save them all. He would not forsake Flea Bottom like everyone else had. And he would not stop there he would be the voice for them all, for all of the voiceless. It was a sunny day in King's Landing. Plump clouds lazed about in the sky, and the sun shone brightly on all of the people. The Red Keep was as beautiful as ever, the colorful flowers and the large stone walls were very pleasing to the eye, and trees swayed in the wind. Cersei Lannister, the queen, felt it was a perfect day for a walk, so that's exactly what she did. With her seven-year-old son holding her hand and nine-year-old stepson at her side, the latter was not there by her request, the beautiful lion walked the streets of her home. Sander Clegane, more commonly known as the Hound, walked behind her, always ready to spill some blood. The bane of her existence's nanny, an older woman named Arya, walked with them as well. The woman was always by the bastard side. One day, this will all be yours, Joffrey. The queen said to her child. Her blonde hair matched his, and the two truly looked like mother and son. Marcus, on the other hand, was out of place with his black hair and fair pale skin. The boy definitely looked like his mother, or that's what Robert would go on and on about. Cersei looked at the boy with hateful eyes. The spectacle seven years ago with the High Septon and all the people who came to bend their knee to an infant fools, in the Queen's opinion, had struck the flames within the woman at first. She had never been so angry before in her life. 
Her son was the rightful heir and would be their king, yet they bowed to a bastard. She wanted the boy dead but knew it was a terrible idea. Robert loved Marcus more than he loved her and definitely more than he loved Joffrey. If anything happened to him, there wasn't a place far enough from King's Landing for her or anyone to be safe from Robert's wrath. So she had to deal with it and push it aside. After a few months, most of the fuss died down, the majority of the gathered people returning to their homes. Some stayed, though, and every time a man or woman bowed to the boy while in her presence, it only reminded her of how much she truly despised the pretender. Bastards were not meant to rule, it was common knowledge. No one can take this away from you, my precious son. Cersei continued. She never outright showed her hatred for the child, she was too smart to do such a foolish thing. She didn't beat him or have him terrorized, but he knew she didn't like him, she was sure of it. They arrived at a beautiful garden that she herself had ordered to be made. The cacophony of colors that certain plants and flowers birthed were truly amazing, and Cersei couldn't help but be proud of her decision. As the queen walked about her garden, her true son at her side, Marcus and Arya made their way to the other side. The queen couldn't bar access to the prince for no reason, so he was still allowed into her sanctuary, but that didn't mean she had to walk by his side the entire time. Marcus didn't mind it much. He quite enjoyed it, actually. Cersei was a handful, to put it mildly. Marcus was already nine now, and his training in both his body and mind had excelled far beyond that of an average child of his age. He saw the world clearer than most adults now. His eyes had matured remarkably. Everything he could do before with his eyes was now enhanced, so much so that it was frightening, even for Marcus himself. His training with Sir Barristan and Sir Jamie had been coming along marvelously. It would have gone by much quicker if they had let him use his special eyes to copy their movement, but that was one of the rules. There was no cheating, which meant he couldn't use those eyes to quicken the process. The Barristan, form and finesse didn't matter. All that stuff came later, after one learned what was truly important. Instincts. The skilled knights wanted his body to learn the movements and then his eyes. They wanted him to be able to work a sword like he had been using one for years, which was no small feat. The kind of skill he was forced to learn was by no means for children or even teenagers, but Marcus had asked for it. He needed to get stronger and with each passing day, he was. He could feel his strength increase with every lesson. What are you thinking about, my prince? Arya asked. Her voice was always so smooth, so loving. Marcus's eyes roamed the multitude of flowers and plants that decorated the entire place, his face serene. This really is a beautiful place, you know. He said with a mesmerized voice. Arya chuckled softly, the wrinkles of old age just starting to show their unwanted heads. Yes, it is quite beautiful. She looked at the black hair of her prince and future king. It's not like you to state the obvious, my boy. Marcus loved it when she spoke so affectionately with him. He had always seen her as a mother figure and quite possibly the most important person in his entire life. She was there when he had no one since he could remember. No Marcus whispered, turning to the woman. He took a deep breath, exhaling as he opened his eyes. Arya was met with beautiful crimson orbs, three commas in each eye. The black commas spun in a circle and Arya knew that happened when her son no he wasn't her son, no matter how much both of them wished it were so. His eyes yes, his eyes always spun when he was excited. Words can't describe what I am able to see. Marcus continued. The colors, the energy, the life that flows in this place it's almost overwhelming. Arya smiled as Marcus reached out to a rather dead-looking flower, its color now a dark brown. Where there is beauty, there is also the unbeautiful. Perfection does not exist, not truly. Arya said to the boy as he stared at the dead flower. Marcus observed the flower, his eyes showing it in great detail. It was so sad. The dead, ugly flower sat amongst the living, beautiful flowers, almost like it was being mocked by the others. Marcus took in a deep breath, focusing the energy that ran like a rampant river within him. Still holding the flower, he managed, and this was after two whole years of practice to direct the energy to the palm of his hand. Arya watched in awe and excitement as a blue flame enveloped both the boy's hand and the plant he was holding. The flame pulsed and breathed as if it were alive, flickering around Marcus's hand like it, too, was excited. It was a feeling Arya couldn't explain. Whenever she saw the blue flame, something deep within her felt warm, like it was calling out to her, reaching into her to caress something. Marcus's face showed just how much he had to focus to do what he was doing. It wasn't like his eyes. Once he activated his eyes, they would stay the way he wanted until he deactivated them. The energy within him obviously powered them, but he didn't have to consciously send the energy anywhere, his eyes did that for him. But what he was doing at the moment, he couldn't afford to lose focus, for one slip and he would fail. His eyes closed and his breathing became labored. It took so much out of him suddenly, the blue flame flickered, turning a deep purple and much, much larger. After a few seconds, Marcus let go of the flower, almost falling to the ground in exhaustion. 
He caught himself, holding his hands on his knees, taking in deep breaths. Arya was immediately at his side, her hand rubbing his back gently. This takes too much out of you, Marcus's nanny whispered in worry. After taking a few moments to catch his breath, Marcus murked, pointing at the flower he had just held. And there, where a dead, ugly flower once sat, a beautiful, multicolored flower replaced it, its beauty unmatched by all the rest. Whereas the previously dead flower was mocked by its prettier counterparts, this flower stood tall, and all the other ordinary flowers seemed to weep at its beauty. Perfection. Marcus whispered, still catching his breath. Arya narrowed her eyes at the young boy in faux anger, shaking her head in exasperation. You really are a stubborn child, you know that. She chuckled softly and helped the boy she thought as a son up, holding him by his arm. It really is a beautiful flower, though. She added shortly, looking at him out of the corner of her eye with the smallest of smirks adorning her aging face. Marcus nodded with a giant smile on his face, his childish side slipping through the cracks. After walking some more, Marcus sighed. But it's not enough he said sadly. Arya looked away from him, already knowing his plight. The boy felt responsible for Flea Bottom and the rest of the places in the entire world that was struck with poverty. He knew that money couldn't accomplish his goals, not entirely. Money couldn't build the much-needed homes that the people of his father's kingdom needed. There were far too many homes that needed to be built and far too little money. Money couldn't buy enough food to feed all of the poor. There were far too many people to feed and far too little money. That left them with only one other option. He had to do what that man did, what Hashirama did. What he had done. You are only still a child, Marcus to do even that is impossible for anyone but you. Arya tried to reason with the boy. But he was a Baratheon, and Baratheons were all stubborn to the bone. The people can't wait for me to learn everything I need to learn to help them. They need help now. He sighed deeply again. Making a single flower healthy again almost drains me how can I save the people when I can barely save a single flower. Arya was silent for a moment, her mind trying to find the best way to say this. After realizing that there was no best way to say something harsh, she just blurted out what she hoped he needed to hear. Marcus Baratheon. She began her rant. You're just a child. The goals you set are too high, and you will never be able to achieve anything if you don't start somewhere that's closer to your level. You do not finish your dinner in one giant bite. You take your time and finish it bite by bite. She placed a firm hand on his shoulder, her eyes locking onto his crimson orbs, the eyes she always thought were so beautiful. You can do things and see things that are so beyond everything and everyone else, it's amazing. Don't waste your time beating yourself up because you can't accomplish something right away. You have the strength to do whatever you want. Now stop moping and stand up straight. You're the king of kings, not a beggar. Throughout Arya's scolding, Marcus just stayed silent, watching the woman yell at him for, well, being an idiot. Of course he couldn't produce entire villages and forests with nothing but his will. He was nine and had no idea what he was doing in the first place. Arya was right he was being an idiot. She hadn't said that, but it was implied. He was only nine, he had plenty of time to work on his skills. He wouldn't be breaking his promises if he took his time and really tried to learn what exactly it was he was trying to do. And the fact that Arya was going to be there the entire time, helping him, guiding him through his own stupidity, really reassured him. She really was just like a mother to him. Loving and gentle the majority of the time and stern and strict when she needed to be. You're right Marcus nodded. I can't rush this. I want to help these people, not cause them any more chaos he smiled at the woman he yearned to call mother, his special eyes etching her face into his mind. He'd never forget what she looked like. Ever. Good. Arya proclaimed, rather happy that her speech got through to the stubborn boy. Now, we should find the queen. We wouldn't want her to start to worry about our safety. The deceiving smile on her face made Marcus laugh. This woman really was his best friend. Together, Marcus and Arya walked side by side, gazing at the pretty garden as they tried to find Cersei. They didn't mind being left behind, they preferred it. It was easier to relax when you weren't constantly around someone who hates you. As they walked, Marcus thought about his training with Barristan and Jaime. He was by no means a skilled warrior yet, but he was definitely getting the hang of wielding a sword. His strength was phenomenal, far greater than anyone his age. Jaime said that not even he had been at the level Marcus was when he was nine. It wouldn't be long. He would soon be the best sword in the world. His thoughts were interrupted with the sound of Cersei's voice. He didn't know it no one could have possibly known, but this was the moment that would give the Garden of the Red Keep its name. For when Marcus and Arya turned around, it wasn't just Cersei who greeted them. Grab them. A large man shouted. He was bald and was as big as the mountain. He had Queen Cersei in his grasp, his face twisted into a mixture of malice and sick joy. With his order given, two more large men flanked them, grabbing hold of both Marcus and Arya. Marcus saw the terrified looks of both Cersei and young Joffrey. 
Tears ran down the blonde-haired boy's face, his mouth covered by a big hand. Cersei looked afraid, but not for herself. Cersei Lannister may be many things, many, many terrible things, but a bad mother she was not. The thought of her child being hurt terrified her, so much so that she trembled. This is him. The big, bold man holding Cersei asked. He pointed a finger at Marcus, and Cersei looked at the child with uncertain eyes. Arya narrowed her eyes at the queen as the lioness looked into the pure black eyes of Marcus Baratheon. And in that moment, Cersei Lannister gave him a look he had never seen from her before. It was. Affection. Is that Marcus Baratheon, son of the king the bald man shouted again. This time, he shook the queen for good measure. He grabbed her by the cheeks with his hand, forcing her to look at the child she loathed for so long. And after a moment of silence, Cersei Lannister did the strangest thing. She shook her head in the negative. No. Cersei started, tears falling down her beautiful face. He's her son. She pointed to Arya. She's just my daughter's new nanny. I was meeting them here to discuss a sleepover with. Shut your mouth, bitch. The man yelled, yanking her by the hair. You better not be lying to me, whore, or I'll rape your daughter and make you watch before I kill her. Cersei cried out, and her eyes once again met Marcus's. I'm telling you the truth I, she looked away from him, her eyes closing, I hate the king's bastard. Ask anyone as she spoke, Cersei herself didn't know why she was saying what she was saying, and she didn't have time to think about that. She was too busy wondering when the hound would return with her brother, an order he was given not ten minutes ago, before any of this had happened. He would save them. Jamie would save her. He was always there for her. Always. Since birth and after death they would always say. The man sighed. He shook his head in faux empathy. That's too bad, then. He said. Cause we were told to get the prophesized one area looked at Marcus in terror. First. The man finished, and Cersei's eyes widened. First. As in. She looked to her son, and then at the man who was holding him, and saw his sword ready to strike down the boy. Bing Balin Greyjoy sends his regards. The man holding Cersei said for everyone to hear, a sick smile on his face. No. Cersei screamed, trying to get out the man's arms. The man's sword rose. The man's sword fell. But not on the prince. Metal falling on stone rang out in the garden, the man's sword falling out of his hands as another was drove through his neck. Blood sprayed out, covering Joffrey, soaking his golden crown red. He would dare lay hand on the king's family in King's Landing. Jamie Lannister's voice was heard, and the queen's tears began to flow harder. He had come. He came to save his family. The rest of the men forty, at the very least drew their swords, all poised at Jamie Lannister and Sander Clegane. But neither man faltered. The hound feared one thing and one thing only. He looked around. There was no fire here. Jamie just stared at them, his face a stoic facade. He was widely considered the greatest swordsman in all of Westeros, he feared no man. He was a king's guard, and he would not let another man touch his sister. You'll die for that one, Kingslayer. The bald man spat as he threw the queen to the side, drawing his sword. He was ordered to kill the children, not the queen. Blade piercing flesh was heard, and a strangled gasp shortly after. Marcus turned his head, very slowly, to his right. When he saw it, he just blinked. That's all. He saw it, but he didn't register it. He could smell the blood, but that too was cast aside. His eyes bled red, and he could see the colors fading from her body, but he wouldn't accept it. So he just blinked, his mind blank, his eyes. Was he crying? Why was he crying? Did something happen? That's when he finally realized it. When he finally realized that it was real. The man holding Arya ran his blade across her throat, taking away his nan his mother. Her body fell to the ground limp, landing in an unceremonious way. The man laughed. Arya was dead. They killed her. She was gone. Forever. They took her away from him. People handle loss in many different ways. Some scream to the heavens in agony. Some lost consciousness, their pain too much to handle. Some couldn't breathe, they were so shocked. Others cursed and blamed the gods, their hate for something when there was nothing so strong. For each person, the method changed. For Marcus, it was the strangest feeling in the entire world. Never before had he ever felt something like this. His eyes his eyes burned, and his brain felt like it was set aflame. It hurt, but even still, he didn't show any signs of even being aware of what was going on. He just stood there, his captor already letting him go as he went to slay the Kingslayer. He just stood there like stone. His heart it felt cold like it had frozen over. That alone was strange. His eyes and head felt as hot as the sun, but his heart his heart was colder than winter. Everything just seemed to stop, to halt all motion. His eyes gazed upon what was Arya, her now dead corpse lying at his feet. He suddenly looked away, gazing at the men who had done this, who had taken her away from him. He didn't even see people. He saw animals, or better yet, bugs. And they were all at his mercy. How, he did not know. He just he could feel it. 
it was his eyes. Vengeance. Whisper his name, and it will be yours. These words were whispered into his ear, the voice unknown but so very familiar. He stared at the men who were trying to kill Jamie Lannister and Sander Clegane, before he looked back at Arya. Who are you? He asked the voice out loud. His voice was calm and collected, as if he hadn't lost the most important person in his life just then. The voice laughed madly, somehow echoing in his head. Such a silly question. The voice replied. Marcus decided that the voice didn't matter at the moment. He looked at Arya again. I'm sorry he whispered. He knelt down, closing her eyes that somehow still stared at him. She didn't need to see what was going to happen. Please, he began as he stood, turning away from her to face the men who killed his mother. Forgive me for what I am about to do. And for what I am about to become. That's when it happened. Marcus took in a deep breath, and then, he roared in agony. His voice was so loud, so very, very loud. Everyone in the garden turned to him, shocked. The wind became fiercer, so fierce that everyone had to shield their eyes from it with their arms. All the while, Marcus screamed, and all he knew was pain. Pain. Images of red clouds flooded his mind, but he ignored them. Blue flame surrounded him, circling him in a vortex of energy. It was the first time they had seen the colors like he always had. He'd show them. He'd let them see it before he killed them. He heard the voice again, but this time, it only spoke a single word. That single word was so familiar, like he had spoken it before, but he was sure he had It didn't matter. He whispered it anyways. He brought it back into the world. He brought him back. He with the ability to help by all means. Susanu. His eyes bled, he noticed. But that too didn't matter. All that mattered was what was his to claim. Vengeance. When he spoke that single word, that single name, it appeared. A dark purple, skeletal demon appeared its form ethereal. It had large glowing eyes and a malevolent grin. Horns grew out of its head and it hovered over Marcus ominously. His eyes burned so bad now, he could barely contain it, but he pushed that away as well. Nothing but vengeance mattered. He would avenge Arya. Jamie locked gazes with his student, and when he saw the boy's eyes, he knew that something was different. Where three commas used to spin in each eye, thin loops in a starburst pattern now sat, with blood falling from them. The demonic entity that surrounded Marcus raised its hand, and a sword, made of the same dark purple energy as the being itself, came into existence. And then, Marcus began to stain the garden red. A single swing of the demon's mighty sword and ten men were cut in half, dead before they even hit the ground. Cersei Lannister stood frozen, her legs shaking, her heart racing. What was she witnessing? Another three tried to run away. All three were pierced by dark purple arrows, holes the size of giant boulders now through their hearts. Sander Clegane let his sword fall to the ground, his eyes not letting him turn away. What was he witnessing? Seven fell to their knees, praying to be spared. All seven were shown no mercy and no longer possessed a head. Prince Joffrey had already fainted before his uncle and sworn shield even arrived. Five held onto their swords, rushing at the demon and its master. All five died before they even took their fourth step. Arya's eyes were closed, so she did not have to witness what her son was doing. It was better that way. Fourteen more tried to attack, hoping their numbers would help them kill this thing. All fourteen were slaughtered like cattle, their blood soaking the beautiful flowers the same color as his eyes. Marcus turned his head to the last man alive, his eyes piercing through the man like a sharp blade. The man's knees shook, and the smell of urine was strong and very, very recent on him. He was covered in blood, the blood of his brothers. P.P. please bear M me he begged, stuttering out of fear. Marcus began to walk, the giant skeletal demon following him, confirming that he was indeed the master. The eyes of the demon, the eyes that glowed yellow, watched him like a predator, and he was the prey. Oh gods P please, save M me. He shouted to the sky, falling to his knees. The seven aren't with you today Marcus whispered, causing the man cower and cry. Susa knew that's what the entity was called grabbed the man, taking him into the air. His hands were large enough to encase the man's entire upper body. What is your name? He asked. Be Daniel, my lord O of the Iron Islands the now named Daniel stuttered out. Marcus stared at the man, his powerful eyes staring into the man's very soul. And then, he spoke. You killed her he said. You killed my friend. Indeed, this man, Daniel of the Iron Islands, was the one to slit Arya's throat. Daniel's eyes widened, his heart freezing. I I, I'm sorry. I'm so as sorry. The second word was whispered by the voice, and again, Marcus uttered it. A matter asu. Sander Clegane fell back, terrified. He scurried back, away from Marcus Baratheon, fear in his eyes as he watched a man in the demon's hands burned by black flames. The smell of burning flesh was dominant in the garden, and screams of pain and agony was the only thing that could be heard. After the screams were no longer heard, Susanu dropped the dead body, letting the flames from hell erase the man from existence. 
Marcus watched the burning body for a moment before he let go of Susanu, the mighty entity fading from creation, retreating back into the accursed eyes, awaiting for the next time its master would call on it. He looked at those present, his starburst eyes observing Jamie, Cersei and Sander. He then turned to Arya and once again he cried, but this time it was not tears of blood, but regular ordinary tears that mixed with the blood staining his cheeks. The first lesson has been completed. The voice whispered. You have become a true Avenger. Marcus clenched his fists, his face twisting into rage. Who are you? He shouted aloud, frightening Cersei and Sander. Jaime was just numb, silently staring at the boy at his king. Isn't it obvious, stupid boy? The voice began. I'm you. Marcus spoke the voice's words. And then, everything went black. So that's it for today, I hope did you enjoyed this video, if you do please leave a like, share and subscribe, so let's call it today, see ya in next video.